photomultiplier tubes, members of the class of vacuum tubes, and more specifically vacuum phototubes, are extremely sensitive detectors of light in the ultraviolet, visible, and near-infrared ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum. These detectors multiply the current produced by incident light by as much as 100 million times, in multiple dynode stages enabling individual photons to be detected when the incident flux of light is very low. Unlike most vacuum tubes, they are not obsolete. The combination of high gain, low noise, high frequency response or, equivalently, ultrafast response, and large area of collection has maintained photomultipliers an essential place in nuclear and particle physics, astronomy. Medical diagnostics including blood tests, medical imaging, motion picture film scanning, radar jamming, and high-end image scanners known as drum scanners. Elements of photomultiplier technology, when integrated differently, are the basis of night vision devices, semiconductor devices, particularly avalanche photodiodes, are alternatives to photomultipliers. However, photomultipliers are uniquely well suited for applications requiring low noise, high sensitivity detection of light that is imperfectly collimated, structure and operating principles. Photomultipliers are typically constructed with an evacuated glass housing, containing a photocathode, several dynodes, and an anode. Incident photons strike the photocathode material, which is usually a thin vapor-deposited conducting layer on the inside of the entry window of the device. Electrons are ejected from the surface as a consequence of the photoelectric effect. These electrons are directed by the focusing electrode toward the electron multiplier, where electrons are multiplied by the process of secondary emission. The electron multiplier consists of a number of electrodes called dynodes. Each dynode is held at a more positive potential, by 100 volts, than the preceding one. A primary electron leaves the photocathode with the energy of the incoming photon, or about 3 electron volts for blue photons, minus the work function of the photocathode. A small group of primary electrons is created by the arrival of a group of initial photons. The primary electrons move toward the first inode because they are accelerated by the electric field. They each arrive with 100 electron volts kinetic energy imparted by the potential difference. Upon striking the first inode, more low energy electrons are emitted, and these electrons are in turn accelerated toward the second dynode. The geometry of the dynode chain is such that a cascade occurs with an exponentially increasing number of electrons being produced at each stage. For example, if at each stage an average of 5 new electrons are produced for each incoming electron, and if there are 12 dynode stages, then at the last stage one expects for each primary electron about 512-108 electrons. This last stage is called the anode. This large number of electrons reaching the anode results in a sharp current pulse that is easily detectable, for example on an oscilloscope, signaling the arrival of the photon at the photocathode 50 nanoseconds earlier. The necessary distribution of voltage along the series of dynodes is created by a voltage divider chain, as illustrated in the figure. In the example, the photocathode is held at a negative high voltage of order 1000 V, while the anode is very close to ground potential. The capacitors across the final few dynodes act as local reservoirs of charge to help maintain the voltage on the dynodes while electron avalanches propagate through the tube. Many variations of design are used in practice, the design shown is merely illustrative. There are two common photomultiplier orientations, the head-on or end-on design, as shown above, where light enters the flat, circular top of the tube and passes the photocathode, and the side-on design, where light enters at a particular spot on the side of the tube and impacts on an opaque photocathode. The side-on design is used, for instance, in the Type 931, the first mass-produced PMT. 
besides the different photocathode materials. Performance is also affected by the transmission of the window material that the light passes through, and by the arrangement of the dynodes. A large number of photomultiplier models are available having various combinations of these and other design variables. Either of the manuals mentioned will provide the information needed to choose an appropriate design for a particular application. History Combining two scientific discoveries the invention of the photomultiplier is predicated upon two prior achievements. The separate discoveries of the photoelectric effect and of secondary emission. Photoelectric effect The first demonstration of the photoelectric effect was carried out in 1887 by Heinrich Hertz using ultraviolet light. Significant for practical applications, Elster and Geitel two years later demonstrated the same effect using visible light striking alkali metals. The addition of cesium, another alkali metal, has permitted the range of sensitive wavelengths to be extended towards longer wavelengths in the red portion of the visible spectrum. Historically, the photoelectric effect is associated with Albert Einstein, who relied upon the phenomenon to establish the fundamental principle of quantum mechanics in 1905, an accomplishment for which Einstein received the 1921 Nobel Prize. It is worthwhile to note that Heinrich Hertz, working 18 years earlier, had not recognized that the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons is proportional to the frequency but independent of the optical intensity. This fact implied a discrete nature of light, i.e., the existence of quanta, for the first time. Secondary emission The phenomenon of secondary emission was, at first, limited to purely electronic phenomena and devices. In 1902, Austin and Stark reported that the metal surfaces impacted by electron beams emitted a larger number of electrons than were incident. The application of the newly discovered secondary emission to the amplification of signals was only proposed after World War I by Westinghouse. Scientist Joseph Slepian in a 1919 patent the race towards a practical electronic television camera The ingredients for inventing the photomultiplier were coming together during the 1920s as the pace of vacuum tube technology accelerated. The primary goal for many, if not most, workers was the need for a practical television camera technology. Television had been pursued with primitive prototypes for decades prior to the 1934 introduction of the first practical camera. Early prototype television cameras lacked sensitivity. Photomultiplier technology was pursued to enable television camera tubes, such as the Iconoscope and the Orthicon, to be sensitive enough to be practical. So the stage was set to combine the dual phenomena of photo emission with secondary emission, both of which had already been studied and adequately understood to create a practical photomultiplier. First photomultiplier Single stage The first documented photomultiplier demonstration dates to the early 1934 accomplishments of an RCA group based in Harrison, NJ. Harley Iams and Bernard Salzberg were the first to integrate a photoelectric effect cathode and single secondary emission amplification stage in a single vacuum envelope and the first to characterize its performance as a photomultiplier with electron amplification gain. These accomplishments were finalized prior to June 1934 as detailed in the manuscript submitted to proceedings of the Institute of Radio Engineers. The device consisted of a semi-cylindrical photocathode, a secondary emitter mounted on the axis, and a collector grid surrounding the secondary emitter. The tube had a gain of about 8 and operated at frequencies well above 10 kHz. Magnetic photomultipliers higher gains were sought than those available from the early single-stage photomultipliers. However, it is an empirical fact that the yield of secondary electrons is limited in any given secondary emission process, regardless of acceleration voltage. Thus, any single-stage photomultiplier is limited in gain. At the time the maximum first-stage gain that could be achieved was approximately 10. 
For this reason, multiple stage photomultipliers, in which the photoelectron yield could be multiplied successively in several stages, were an important goal. The challenge was to cause the photoelectrons to impinge on successively higher voltage electrodes rather than to travel directly to the highest voltage electrode. Initially this challenge was overcome by using strong magnetic fields to bend the electron's trajectories. Such a scheme had earlier been conceived by inventor J. Slepian by 1919. Accordingly, leading international research organizations turned their attention towards improving photomultiplers to achieve higher gain with multiple stages. This work proceeded against a background of economic boom and bust, tyrannical dictatorship, and cataclysmic war clouds collecting on the horizon. In the USSR, RCA manufactured radio equipment was introduced on a large scale by Joseph Stalin to construct broadcast networks, and the newly formed All-Union Scientific Research Institute for Television was gearing up a research program in vacuum tubes that was advanced for its time and place. Numerous visits were made by RCA scientific personnel to the USSR in the 1930s, prior to the Cold War, to instruct the Soviet customers on the capabilities of RCA equipment and to investigate customer needs. During one of these visits, in September 1934, RCA's Vladimir Zwerikin was shown the first multiple dynode photomultiplier, or photoelectron multiplier. This pioneering device was proposed by Leonid A. Kubetsky in 1930 which he subsequently built in 1934. The device achieved gains of 1000x or more when demonstrated in June 1934. The work was submitted for print publication only two years later, in July 1936 as emphasized in a recent 2006 publication of the Russian Academy of Sciences which terms it Kubetsky's tube. The Soviet device used a magnetic field to confine the secondary electrons and relied on the Agosis photocathode, which had been demonstrated by General Electric in the 1920s. By October 1935, Vladimir Zwerikin, George Ashmoon Morton, and Louis Malter of RCA in Camden, NJ submitted their manuscript describing the first comprehensive experimental and theoretical analysis of a multiple dynode tube, the device later, called a photomultiplier, to proc. Aya. The RCA prototype photomultipliers also used an Agosis photocathode. They exhibited a peak quantum efficiency of 0.4% at 800 nanometers. Electrostatic photomultipliers Whereas these early photomultipliers used the magnetic field principle, electrostatic photomultipliers were demonstrated by Jan Rajman of RCA Laboratories in Princeton, NJ in the late 1930s and became the standard for all future commercial photomultipliers. The first mass-produced photomultiplier, the Type 931, was of this design and is still commercially produced today. Improved photocathodes also in 1936, a much improved photocathode, C's 3 sb was reported by P. Gorlick. The cesium antimony photocathode had a dramatically improved quantum efficiency of 12% at 400 nanometers and was used in the first commercially successful photomultipliers manufactured by RCA both as a photocathode and as a secondary emitting material for the dynodes. Different photocathodes provided differing spectral responses. Spectral response of photocathodes in the early 1940s, the JEDEC, an industry committee on standardization, developed a system of designating spectral responses. The philosophy included the idea that the product's user need only be concerned about the response of the device rather than how the device may be fabricated. Various combinations of photocathode and window materials were assigned S numbers, ranging from S1 through S40, which are still in use today. 
For example, S11 uses the cesium antimony photocathode with a lime glass window, S13 uses the same photocathode with a fused silica window, and S25 uses a so-called multi-alkali photocathode that provides extended response in the red portion of the visible light spectrum. No suitable photoemissive surfaces have yet been reported to detect wavelengths longer than approximately 1700 nanometers, which can be approached by a special photocathode role of RCA for decades. RCA was responsible for performing the most important work in developing and refining photomultipliers. RCA was also largely responsible for the commercialization of photomultipliers. The company compiled and published an authoritative and very widely used photomultiplier handbook. RCA made printed copies available for free upon request. The handbook, which continues to be made available online at no cost by the successes to RCA, is considered to be an essential reference. Following a corporate breakup in the late 1980s involving the acquisition of RCA by General Electric and disposition of the divisions of RCA to numerous third parties, RCA's photomultiplier business became an independent company. Lancaster, Pennsylvania facility The Lancaster, Pennsylvania facility was opened by the U.S. Navy in 1942 and operated by RCA for the manufacture of radio and microwave tubes. Following World War II, the naval facility was acquired by RCA. RCA Lancaster, as it became known, was the base for development and production of commercial television products. In subsequent years other products were added, such as cathode ray tubes, photomultiplier tubes, motion sensing light control switches, and closed circuit television systems. Burl Industries Burl Industries, as a successor to the RCA Corporation, carried the RCA photomultiplier business forward after 1986, based in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania facility. The 1986 acquisition of RCA by General Electric resulted in the divestiture of the RCA Lancaster New Products Division. Hence, 45 years after being founded by the U.S. Navy, its management team, led by Eric Berlfinger, purchased the division and in 1987 founded Burl Industries. In 2005, after 18 years as an independent enterprise, Burl Industries and a key subsidiary were acquired by Photonish, a European holding company Photonish Group. Following the acquisition, Photonish was composed of Photonish Netherlands, Photonish France, Photonish USA, and Burl Industries. Photonish USA operates the former Galileo Corporation Scientific Detector Products Group, which had been purchased by Burl Industries in 1999. The group is known for microchannel plate detector electron multipliers, an integrated micro-vacuum tube version of photomultipliers. MCPs are used for imaging and scientific applications, including night vision devices. On 9 March 2009, Photonish announced that it would cease all production of photomultipliers at both the Lancaster, Pennsylvania and the Breve, France plants. Other companies The Japan-based company Hamamatsu Photonics has emerged since the 1950s as a leader in the photomultiplier industry. Hamamatsu, in the tradition of RCA, has published its own handbook, which is available without cost on the company's website. Hamamatsu uses different designations for particular photocathode formulations and introduces modifications to these designations based on Hamamatsu's proprietary research and development. Photocathode materials The photocathodes can be made of a variety of materials with different properties. Typically the materials have low work function and are therefore prone to thermionic emission, causing noise and dark current, especially the materials sensitive in infrared, cooling the photocathode lowers this thermal noise. The most common photocathode materials are agoses. Transmission mode, sensitive from 300 to 1200 nanometers. 
High dark current, used mainly in near-infrared, with the photocathode called gas seas. Cesium activated gallium arsenide, flat response from 300 to 850 nanometers, fading towards ultraviolet and to 930 nanometers. In gas seas. Cesium activated indium gallium arsenide, higher infrared sensitivity than gas seas. Between 900 to 1000 nanometers, much higher signal to noise ratio than AGO seas. SBCs. Cesium activated antimony, used for reflective mode photocathodes, response range from ultraviolet to visible, widely used, B alkali, cesium activated antimony rubidium or antimony potassium alloy, similar to SBCs, with higher sensitivity and lower noise, can be used for transmission mode, favorable response to an ITL scintillator flashes makes them widely used in gamma spectroscopy and radiation detection. High temperature B alkali can operate up to 175 degrees Celsius, used in well logging, low dark current at room temperature, multi-alkali, wide spectral response from ultraviolet to near-infrared, special cathode processing can extend range to 930 nanometers, used in broadband spectrophotometers, solar blind, sensitive to vacuum UV and ultraviolet. Insensitive to visible light and infrared, window materials The windows of the photomultipliers act as wavelength filters. This may be irrelevant if the cutoff wavelengths are outside of the application range or outside of the photocathode sensitivity range, but special care has to be taken for uncommon wavelengths. Barosilicate glass is commonly used for near-infrared to about 300 nanometers. Glass with very low content of potassium can be used with B-alkali photocathodes to lower the background radiation from the potassium-40 isotope. Ultraviolet glass transmits visible and ultraviolet down to 185 nanometers. Used in spectroscopy, synthetic silica transmits down to 160 nanometers, absorbs less UV than fused silica. Different thermal expansion than Kovar, a graded seal needed between the window and the rest of the tube. The seal is vulnerable to mechanical shocks. Magnesium fluoride transmits ultraviolet down to 115 nanometers. Hygroscopic, though less than other alkali halides usable for UV windows.